China promised Hong Kong one country, two systems, but the reality looks much different. How is the CCP's broken promise affecting Hong Kong's economy? Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Joining me today is Edward Chin, a Hong Kong activist, hedge fund manager, and founder of 2047 Hong Kong Monitor. Thanks for joining me, Ed. Chris, it's good to see you in less than 100 days, I think. Less than 100 days are about. Well, so these protests have been going on for a long time now, over 100 days. Uh, how has that affected the economy of Hong Kong? Some of the retail businesses definitely have suffered, but a lot of people are sympathetic about the current situation because almost it's like the last fight for Hong Kong's um, core values. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, and freedom to move around Hong Kong even. Seems like Hong Kong is turning into more like a semi-police state. Mm. It's something I don't want to see as a business person. Yeah, I mean, you've seen police, uh, police and protesters clashing in malls. That's definitely not good for businesses. No, it's not. And um, I have seen students, very young people, very young age, 12, 13 years old even, yeah. and very senior people seen it in terms of age. They come out in unison to defend what they think. And it's not just young people protesting. There's been lawyer protests, doctor protests. This is really an all level of society. I'm touched, I'm, I'm touched honestly, like the uh, medical profession, they do come out, not just the paramedics. I have seen you know, like one fifth year medical school student, like name remain anonymous. Mm -hmm. He would put on full gear. Uh, at first, he was just a paramedic. But when police, you know, which is driven by money because of the overpay, you were paid like one and a half, two times pay as a policeman to uh, control the situation, so to speak, right? When you fire so many tear gas canisters towards uh, demonstrators, the young uh, doctors-to-be, they would gear up now. I've seen them, you know, like dress as more like uh, the, like the, um, the Batmans, the... Mm -hmm the Avengers, so to speak, right, to defend. You know, this is almost like the last fight they believe in because they were born like in the 90s or they are millennials. So they really believe that this is uh, their Hong Kong they call at home. You know, they might not have a memory of the colonial days like us because we benefited from uh, the economic uprising from 30 years ago. They don't see that um, uh, same type of a scenario, uh, but that they could only see like Hong Kong as a more polarization. So that's why they, they came out. And even the older generation, they come out and support. So how are businesses reacting? Now, definitely, you, uh, it's uh, extremes. You could see, you know, like the, the big real estate developers who are, some of them are members of the uh, National People Congress or uh, Political Consultative Conference. Which is a mainland Chinese organization. Yeah, right. So they have to kowtow the big developers have to counter and say, condemn everyone. They would say, uh, put up newspaper ads and condemn the demonstrators from, you know, like um, causing so-called trouble. And part of the reason housing prices are so high is because of an influx of uh, rich mainland Chinese people, correct? The housing prices have um, been up a lot, you know, over the last few decades. But even with the protests going on in the last hundred days or so, uh, people are concerned, but it, it's not like a dropping like a rock. You know, there's still a lot of China money supporting the real estate. But then the Hong Kong tycoons, they are also afraid that they will be replaced by the mainland princelings. Mm -hmm. So they're extracting, you know, even the last penny from the normal Hong Kong people. Mm -hmm. That's something we won't want to see. So as um, in unity for the first time, the young professionals, those people who are uh, retiring, the so-called upper middle class too, are joining this so-called uh, movement. It's beyond the extradition deal now. It's uh, fighting, it's like the last fight for, for Hong Kong. It, Hong Kong people, most of them, I would say 99.999% are not asking for Hong Kong's independence. Mm -hmm. They are fighting for at least the Deng Xiaoping model, which is the two systems has to remain intact. We don't have that now. The Hong Kong government has said the protests are about economic inequality or livelihood issues. Do you think that's true? I think that's part of the problem, definitely. Mm -hmm. Because 20 years ago, you could see like a young accountant um, who 
is making 10,000 Hong Kong per month, 20 years later is still making 10,000 Hong Kong per month. I would think if we want some more radical changes, you know, like the Hong Kong government should, like the Singapore model, build something like, a, like for young family, at least have four to 500 square feet of living space. I mean, you cannot have like 150 square feet net having like a four person household living, you know, in that so-called like a truncated um, home, right? It, it's not, it's inhumane, honestly. You're talking about Hong Kong is so rich, it's also so polarized. And also, for instance, the minimum monthly salary for university graduates, it cannot be like 10,000 forever over the last 25 years. It has to be some minimum standard, just like a minimum wage. Let's say 20,000, 21, 22,000 honky. Make it, make the society more fair. So far, you know, like a lot of people, when they, they come out, it's also, they don't see a future. The Civil Human Rights Front, one of the major organizers of the protests, uh, has accused Beijing of economic imperialism. Has becoming part of China helped the Hong Kong economy? Now, last time, Chris, when you were in Hong Kong, we already talked about um, liquid assets moving overseas mm -hmm. to Singapore, Jersey, Channel Island. I have not seen this uh, trend from stopping, to be honest. So money is still going out of Hong Kong? Of course, you know, like people won't, you know, like uh, think twice about, you know, like the so-called, you know, right now it's jurisdiction risks. People have to think about it. Now, uh, with the, um, uh, the Human Rights um, and uh, Democracy Act, that could be a reality in the U.S. They could penalize, you know, like uh, Ho Hong Kong um, or Beijing government people from entering the U.S. or freezing their assets. Would they have some retaliation to the pro-democracy people too? Uh, and also those two million people who come out to the streets who are uh, fighting for their own freedoms? I don't know. So that, that's uh, something called like a backup plan or people have to think about uh, logically if Hong Kong is under duress. So first of all, Beijing could retaliate by freezing some of the activist um, assets too. So liquid assets is very important. So I, I think anyone with 1 million Hong Kong, um, which is like 150,000 US, they could think, hey, if I open a premier account in one of the global banks, they want to offshore maybe 60% of the assets overseas, wow. like a 6-4 allocation. Hmm. Not in remembrance of uh, the Tiananmen 6-4, but the 6-4 allocation could be wise because you could, money movement, you can do it quite easily. Now, I know a lot of uh, Hong Kong companies like Cathay Pacific have come under pressure from the Chinese Communist Party to come out against the protesters. Do you think more Hong Kong companies will face that kind of pressure? Even like BNP Paribas, uh, which is a French bank, uh, which is quite controversial. I think um, one of the activist lawyer, Jason Eng, resigned abruptly just, uh, I think, two weeks ago because of uh, his comments uh, on his Facebook. Now, a lot of Hong Kong people are singing uh, a song called um, May Glory Be to Hong Kong. I don't know whether you, you listen to it on YouTube. We've heard it there. Yeah, and then there were some uh, mainland uh, tourists slash protesters were um, raiding uh, IFC, which is um, a high-end shopping mall at the financial center, right? Like your Twin Towers equivalent. And then Jason was uh, commenting something about the mainland protesters. And then um, someone saw that and then has it circulated in uh, Weibo and then he went into some trouble and then he um, resigned or uh, he um, is no longer with uh, BNP. It's unprecedented. This is uh, what I call white terror. White, not the word Caucasian white, but uh, terror in general. We like to use that term, white terror. Yeah. has nothing to do with the race. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, how would you define white terror? It's horror show. I mean, it's, it's like intimidation. It's like what happened to, to me um, 10 months ago, right? January 1st, you know, when I 
write the, you know, like a protest sign saying, uh, President Xi Jinping, uh, please release the two Canadians. The whole world is watching. So even before I come out, they visited my office and say, um, I detain an interviewee in my office. And no one comes in for an interview, right, mm -hmm. on January 1st. So a lot of these weird things do happen because uh, the phones, I, I think a lot of us, <coughs> our phones are, are tapped. Um, so uh, Hong Kong is becoming more and more like a Xinjiang situation with a lot of uh, AI lamps monitoring facial recognition, mm -hmm. credit rating system in 2020. So a lot of things are slowly integrated into uh, the Chinese uh, way. That makes me worry because I don't see the two systems uh, as too valid now. Mm -hmm. That's why people have still, still have to come out and, uh, and fight and to speak up. Mm -hmm. Well, are white collar professionals or, or any <coughs> companies doing anything to support the protesters? As Despite individuals, a lot of them, a lot of them, they do do come out, um, but not a, at a corporate level. You will be penalized. Like Cathay was penalized. I think HSBC, um, they replaced uh, some of the senior executives, right? And then I mentioned the BMP uh, case, and then probably they will come out as individuals and support, uh, sometimes anonymous, sometimes... Um, you know, they have to, if they go out, they have to put on a mask. Unfortunately, this is Hong Kong now. Two credit rating agencies, Moody's and Fitch, have changed the outlook of Hong Kong to negative recently. Why is that? Because they think the protest could be prolonged and also the, um, the retail definitely has uh, suffered. Now, I have um, a friend um, who is uh, at first more like blue ribbon, which is more like pro-Beijing. Pro okay. But now it's more sympathetic towards uh, the protesters because um, his son is around that age too. Mm. So he has um, a retail chain with uh, 15 stores. Um, I won't mention what type of clothing because otherwise you would know who he is. Mm. So of course, um, the sales got affected. The sales dropped 30, 40%. But uh, at first, five years ago, he blamed the... Um, umbrella movement that uh, Professor Benny Tai um, initiated and the finance and banking group that support Occupy Central also support Benny Tai's movement. Uh, he was fiercely against it, but now he becomes more sympathetic because he knows that his son is around that age too. He doesn't see his son's uh, upward mobility as a Hong Kong -er. So even his uh, sales suffer, so he negotiated with the uh, the landlord, which is really in control of Hong Kong's economy. So do you think uh, if one country, two systems begins to become eroded or disappears, that will be good or bad for the economy of Hong Kong? Honestly, the two systems doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, take a look at uh, Macau right now. You um, have Article 23. Mm -hmm. You cannot have a, a protest. People are very... Uh, calm and um, so-called orderly, right? You only got one voice. But Hong Kong, it's uh, quite multicultural before. Mm -hmm. And Hong Kong um, um, has been an international city, but this will become an international city with um, um, a lot of constraints. Now, we don't have a curfew yet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the government uh, hinted that uh, if uh, things got so-called out of control, um, we could have a uh, curfews. Uh, this is they would uh, put up, you know, like. Uh, but but we have a mini curfew going on mm -hmm. right now, uh, and then the police can uh, do uh, searches on people anytime. And then they talk about these this uh, retractable baton could be carried around. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a lot of debate on um, this uh, so-called policeman. Uh, making excessive money, as I alluded to earlier. They could immigrate to Taiwan because the Taiwan immigration investment scheme is only six million uh, um, NT dollars, right? Mm. So with uh, one and a half years of work with a lot of overtime pay, uh, they, could, um, they could immigrate to another country. Mm. 
by bashing a people, which is sad. I mean, I, of course, I say it half jokingly now, but, but actually it's a very bad thing for Hong Kong people fighting Hong Kong people. Mm. But this is um, how the CCP wants to play it. So the U.S. has the Hong Kong Policy Act of 1992, which basically, uh, if, as far as trade relations go, uh, treats Hong Kong as something different and separate from mainland China. Uh, now Congress is talking about passing the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, right. which would have the U.S. government review whether or not uh, there's reason to maintain that uh, difference. What would happen to the Hong Kong economy if the U.S. treats Hong Kong the same as mainland China? That, in fact, remains to be seen. But talk about the Human Rights uh, and Democracy Act first. I think it's a good deterrent, to be honest, because people like Carrie Lam, um, you know, her husband has got a UK passport, same as her son. But um, some of the tycoons who are so pro Beijing, right? The wife is still like a, an American, um, and then. The kids all have a U.S. bank account or um, companies in the U.S. They have to think twice when you try to um, so-called stabilize uh, things in Hong Kong. They have to think about the consequences when you try to, you know, like create so much social unrest. I don't see if, honestly, when you have a rally. When you don't have police, everything is so orderly. Suddenly, when you have like 5,000 policemen came out, like a riot police and then these speedy dragons and then fiercely firing the tear gas and then rubber bullets, suddenly, you know, the, the Hong Kong society goes crazy. Now, go back to the um, Human Rights and um, uh, Democracy Act. I think if uh, the Congress passes it, I think it would be a good deterrent um, for the Hong Kong government to think twice about the evil deeds they try to implement. They have to think very carefully. So, I mean, I don't know too well about the politicians in the U.S., but I think Marco Rubio and Nancy Pelosi, they are doing a great job by helping Hong Kong. I don't want to talk about Trump. It's a different story. People have a love and hate on President Trump, but uh, definitely the, uh, your congressman has been um, helping Hong Kong. I think, uh, thank you for that. Yeah. It's, it's become a bipartisan issue, which is a miracle in this day and age in the yeah, US. It, it is a miracle to see the US get so united on Hong Kong's issues. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me today, Ed. I hope I don't see you uh, uh, in a long, not too distant future. Yeah, under better circumstances, yes, of I course. hope. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.